If you guys can see, we've got a uh, instant hot water heater um, that we put in, uh, which is a nice feature. It kind of helps lessen our brew days um, and keep the heat down in here because we are brewing inside. Even though we do have a hood, the temperature still gets pretty hot in here. So this helps us just kind of you know, shorten boil uh, heat up time. And then uh, we also have another hot water heater that runs this sink in our selection room across the street. So. One of the interesting features of your Instant Hot is that you dialed in the temperature to exactly what you wanted for your mash, yep. which I thought was really cool, something I would love to have. Sure. And I'm sure a lot of uh, guys would like to have that as well. Yeah, we, I set it for 165 degrees. It goes in the mash time about 150, so it only took like three or four minutes to heat it up to strike, which today we did strike about 164, which mashed in at 151. So yeah, it's pretty convenient. And then over on this side, um, I, heat, I turn it up to 185 and it goes in at about 165. So it takes a little bit longer to heat up to, to 190, which is what this is set for right now. But, but we showed up this morning and in about five minutes, uh, yeah, we, it's were, already we were mashed in because you didn't have to wait for hot water. Yeah, it's great. That was the idea behind it. So uh, luckily the boss has decided to foot the bill on that one. It definitely saves me a lot of times. So. Excellent. Now. On the system, you ended up going with all uh, sanitary fittings. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we, the overall, um, I mean, I, I brewed for years with the polysulfone quick disconnects and then even upgraded to the metal quick disconnects. And honestly, for most home brewers, I would say that's a fine fitting to go with. Um, we kind of wanted, since we sell almost predominantly to commercial breweries, we kind of wanted it to look like a commercial brewery, even though it's very small. So the sanitary fittings were more done out of aesthetics um, than anything. Uh, so not really any functional. Well, I got a lot quieter. Um, but yeah, we, we did decide on it just to kind of give it more of a look and feel of whatever, what our customers are used to. Um, plus, you know, it, it, it's actually been kind of cool because a lot of the people who don't know about beer who've been slowly learning here like to learn about what their customers use versus, you know, homebrew fittings. But um, you know, it was an expensive upgrade and I don't think it's necessary, but it's definitely, definitely pretty cool. Now you've gotten one of the brew sculptures after we got the high flow modified pumps that we had that worked with March to get made. Mm -hmm. And these pumps have a little bit higher flow and less cavitation issues than the previous March pumps. Have Absolutely. you guys experienced any oh, yeah. cavitation issues? No, or? no, not at okay. all. And my last March pump, which is still working after six years, uh, it cavitates all the time, but it still works. These, I haven't had any issues. They work great. Um, I always had a problem with uh, air getting stuck in the line, but you guys thought about that with the uh, Little bleeder with valves the, with here. With the bleeder valve here that allows Which the uh, works, up. I mean, it works great. I, I haven't had any issues with these pumps, and I think March makes great pumps. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure working with them, and I've never, I've never had any problems in six years of owning them, so. Perfect, and you have it dialed out with tri-clamp fittings on all the hose connections and everything we can see. Yeah, and we actually um, built, uh, I ended up ordering a lot of fittings. I bought, uh, we've actually got a hose for every stage instead of using the same hoses over and over. Uh, it was easier to train people with color coding. So I've color coded stuff for each step along the way. Now that everything's in it, it works really well being able to uh, you know, tell people put the black ones on now or put the white ones on and then I've got clear ones over there that I use for transfer at the end of the boil. So. Excellent. And then talk a little bit about your, we essentially have a rotating racking arm from a conical fermenter uh, established on your boil kettle so that you can take fluid from any level. Yeah, we, uh, the main idea behind that was when I worked at the Wild Duck brewery with Jesse Umbarger, who's another sales guys for Hop Union, their uh, 15 barrel brew house actually had a racking arm on the kettle and we both really liked it because even though that it had a diverter plate, uh, they made so many hop forward beers that there was more hops than the diverter plate would hold back. Okay. And I experienced the same sort of thing here, even though I do a whirlpool, at some point the hops start moving towards you know the valve and end up getting in the line and ultimately in the fermenter and I end up losing about a gallon or so of kind of beer or wort hop mix and so we put the racking arm in which actually today will be the first time I use it because it was a little too long so it's uh, I, I got it shortened and bent almost back against the wall and the idea being hopefully that we can get every drop of wort out of here and leave all the hops behind so we will see um, 
So yeah, I don't have any experience with it yet, but I don't see why it won't work great, so. Well, and I think that's a design idea that we'll uh, take from you and maybe modify. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because we... Yeah. <laughs> this is the first big plate. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think it will work fine. Um, I, I, I mean, I did use it before, but it was angled a little bit too far into the true pile. And so it kind of defeated the purpose of it. It still gathered a lot of true. But there was um, enough flow still. Yeah, there was still plenty of flow. It worked fine. Uh, I was worried about it getting clogged, but I mean, I brew with all pellets. Um, and if I do use whole leaf, I use the screen, so I don't really worry about big particulates getting caught in there, so. Because that's something down the road. If it does uh, not have the flow or something, I think we can make something with a larger diameter tube yeah. to pull. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good idea. Just increase the diameter of the whole pipe there. And you went with the whole stainless uh, brushed frame Yep. So no rust issues down the road. Yeah, my last stand, I uh, pow I powder coated it once. I sanded that all down because it didn't. I mean, it was like I spray painted and scraped rust off that thing for six years straight. So when I remember the my boss saying, "Oh, do we really want to spend the money on the nicer you know, frame?" And I was like, "Absolutely. I have plenty of experience with. I mean, metal rust, as we all know, and so." Having it where it's been passivated and then sanded down and then brushed really makes it. And the only the only staining you get is just from heat uh, on the metal itself, which you know you expect. And most of it comes off pretty easy after a brew too. So um, this thing's already made I think ten batches, and I mean it looks brand new. We still, were just so. at Hales Ales yesterday, and they have 150 batches on their machine wow. from 1997. <laughs> And you know, one of, one of the issues I think that you found out with powder coating is, is people think that powder coating is gonna be a tough uh, surface, which is absolutely great for some purposes, but not for heat. Yeah. And so it tends to buckle and flake off at certain points. Yeah, so. my entire stand that I powder coated flaked off. Uh, and then I sanded it all down and repainted it with high temp paint, like stove paint, and it worked pretty well. But anywhere where uh, non-ferrous metal would come in contact with ferrous metal, it would, uh, it would always rust. So I was always scraping down the ring around where the keg sat on it and repainting it. And uh, so I don't have to worry about that on this one, so. And I see you got the digital control panel full option. Yeah. And uh, the automatic valve underneath the hot liquor tank, which maintains your, your temperature during the, the sparge water. Absolutely, I mean, this is, when they told me I could spend the money on getting what I wanted, this, was, this is what I was in search for. Because I had already done everything by hand uh, and with one pump, but I love the idea of being able to set temperature on the hot liquor tank and it just be where I want it to instead of constantly monitoring it. Um, I love being able to do the uh, recirculation mash from mash out. And uh, sometimes if I mash in too low or too high, I'll either use ice to cool it down or I'll use the recirculation to, to um, heat it back up so I don't have to put flame on underneath. And uh, I mean, it just, it's fantastic. I never really thought it, it, you know, it makes me lazier, but it's all right. <laughs> more consistent, we're all about more consistent. Do you recirculate your mash at all during, during the mash or towards the end of yeah, the Yeah, I do. I, I recirculate it at the, um, at the end. I, I've, ex I've played with doing it at the beginning. One thing that the Wild Duck Brewery did was they would mash in for about five minutes and then recirculate for about 20, and they would just recirculate until the starch test showed that it had all been converted, and then they would start sitting over to the kettle. Um, I've still never mashed for 20 minutes only before I start sparging, but I do like to go for about 45 minutes, and then I always do a mash out period, which takes about 10 minutes or so, and then that way I can do the Vorloff recirc and mash out all at once, and so. Perfect. We'll actually be doing that here pretty soon. So, and believe it, I didn't even set a timer, but I think we're, we're all right.